<laughs> well, good morning. It's nice to be in Norman, and I'm thrilled to get to share with you what the Lord has been doing. Um, I also am a minister. I uh, co-pastor a church in Arcadia. It's called Hope City. And the Lord promised that we would take a city. It's been an amazing walk. I have a coffee shop in Arcadia. It's been there now seven years. The first coffee shop came because a person called me and said, I just feel like there should be a church in Arcadia, and I hung up on them. <laughs> I was like, thanks, but no thank you. And I hung up the phone, and as soon as I hung up the phone, the Holy Spirit began to talk to me and said, go take a look at Arcadia. I don't want to. How many of you here today understand that being a Christian is not about coming to church and filling a pew? See, we like, now I'm a walker, so if we're on internet, this may be a problem, but I like to walk when I talk. I, I just can't help that. Um, but here's the thing I'm learning as I am now serving the Lord. I'm in my 60s. I honestly thought that this would be the time of life where I would retire and do fun things just for me. And guess what I found out? The Lord doesn't have a retirement plan. And that's going to upset a few of us. Because we don't like to be told that we can't have some comfort. But here's the fun thing. God never said I wouldn't have comfort in serving him. He just said we don't retire. So here I am, 63 years old, and I'm starting a second coffee shop. Because when this person called me and said, go take a look at Arcadia. When I went into Arcadia, Arcadia had a drug problem. It was very tightly um, put together. Uh, there was a lot of racial tension. I'm... I'm Okay, let me keep going. Whew, Lord, help me. Father, right now, before I go any further, Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask that the Holy Spirit, only you and you alone would have words to speak today. Father, this isn't about people's opinions. It's not about race. It's not about denomination. Lord, I ask that you would enter this place. Holy Spirit, that you would lead, you would guide. I come against every lying spirit. I shut you down right now in the name of Jesus. You have no authority here. You cannot speak any spirit of the enemy. We bind you in the name of Jesus. You will not be able to move. You cannot operate. We come against every Every scheme in the name of Jesus, and we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Okay, now back to Arcadia. So anyway, I went to look at Arcadia after arguing with the Holy Spirit, not, not wanting to be a, um, a pastor and not wanting to start a church. And when I got into the town, the Lord began to speak. It was so funny. Isn't it funny? When we get obedient, then the Lord begins to talk to us. We say, well, I don't hear from God. Well, maybe we should check, is our flesh in the way? Because sometimes when we don't hear from God, it's because our flesh is trying to speak louder than the voice of God. How many of you know that God does not yell? Prove it in the Bible. There was a prophet. His name was Elijah. Where did he find the voice of the Lord? It wasn't in the fire. It wasn't in the earthquake. It was a still, small voice. See, the Father wants us to be so obedient that when he whispers, we come to attention. See, the problem is most of us are still fighting flesh and still saying, well, I have a right to have this. Americans always use that. We have a right. But we're kingdom people. That means you're an alien here. You are simply traveling through. And as a citizen of the kingdom of God, we have been called to be working for the kingdom's purposes. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean just filling the pew on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Though we want you in here, of course we do, because as preachers, we love someone to preach to. But here's the real reason you come to church. It's not to hear the word of God from us, but it's to hear from God the Father be filled. You're to be coming in with a gift to the Father. When you walk through those doors, your hands should be full. You should be offering up a praise to the Father. For we come into his house. When you walk into a house that is not yours, you always should be bringing a gift with you. So now back to Arcadia. So I walked into Arcadia, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, Lord, I really I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to be a, you know, have a church. And that's not, how many have used this? That's not my calling. And the Lord said, that's fine. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to start a coffee shop. I didn't even drink coffee. I thought coffees was Folgers, you know, that stuff you'd get in and put it in water and it instantly turns into this black stuff that smells interesting but tastes horrible. And so I was like, okay, a coffee shop sounds like fun. And so I started what looked like, I thought, a coffee shop. We went to this place in Arcadia that has a strip mall. And I went to the owner and I said, hey, I see you've got all these empty units. Would you let me use one for free? I'm bold. I'm bold. Will you let me use one for free? And she looks at me like I've lost my mind. And I had. And she said, no. 
And I said, well, let me tell you what it is I want to do. And so I went on to tell her that I wanted to open up a coffee shop, and I'd like it to be a ministry-type coffee shop, which means we'd have a Bible study and this kind of stuff. This went on for two years. Two years, I drove that woman nuts. And one night, after another business in Arcadia gave us a place to hold a Bible study, I remember, you know, sometimes the word of the Lord just falls out of my mouth and surprises me too. And that particular night, I had a small gathering of women from Arcadia, and we were having a Bible study. And at the end of the Bible study, the women were complaining, because we were much older women, about driving at night and how it was difficult. And I looked over again to that strip mall that was across the street, and I said, we'll be meeting next door in that in that unit right there next to the subway um, next Tuesday. My sister was there, and her eyes got big as saucers, and she was like, what? And I dismissed in prayer, and when everybody left, she goes, what did you say? I said, I don't know. It just fell right out of my mouth. I said, I guess we better go talk to the owner of that place again. So now remember, two years I've been bothering this lady about, can you give us a place that we can use for free to start a coffee shop Bible study? So I went over there, and I talked to her, and I said, hey, how about this? Let me pay you $25 and let me use it on Tuesday nights. And she goes, just use it. Okay, Lord, that's awesomeness. You know, there's a story in the Bible about that. How about this one? There was an unrighteous judge, and there came a woman before him who would not leave him alone. But she said, I'm going to keep at him until I get justice. See, the problem with this is sometimes we give up too early. So the coffee shop started in Arcadia, and it was the funniest thing ever. And I'm going to try to make this quick. I know I've got limited time, and I do have, believe it or not, a sermon to share with you. Um, but we started off with this first unit. We decorated it. We painted it. And we brought in a Keurig, because remember, I don't know how to make coffee, and I'm thinking it's got to be something like that. And a Keurig looked like it was really fancy. So we had a Keurig, and I bought two syrups, and we bought... Uh, that creamer that's powdered, it's disgusting. And so we bought that, and we made these concoctions, and we started handing them out to everybody. Bless their little hearts, they were trying to be so sweet. Oh, thank you, you know. And so we went on about this for a little while, and we were so proud of our little makeshift coffee-looking area. And, but we started having Bible study, and God began to move. So my sister and I began to take gifts and walk through the community. See, guys, I'm going to tell you, God's calling you not to sit on this pew, but to get up and get moving. And I don't want to hear, well, I'm this age or that age or whatever, because God calls you from the littlest to the oldest. Remember this, it was Caleb that took a mountain at 83 years of age. That kind of lets everybody out, doesn't it? So we started this Bible study. The next thing I know, we get moved from one unit to the next and then another church caught our vision and said, what? I'll never forget this. He came to visit me, and he said, we're sitting down in this new unit with, with long six-foot plastic tables and chairs, and it didn't look anything like a coffee shop. And he goes, what would it take for you all to be a real coffee shop? And I heard Pinocchio. What would it be to be a real boy? And he, my sister looks at him and starts giving a list of things. I had no idea. So she starts telling him how we're going to need an ice machine. We'll need a refrigerator. We're going to need espresso machines. We're going to need a sign outside that says what we are. And I'm looking at her like, what just happened? Who just who hit you? And he goes, okay, well, let's make it happen. And not only did they bring us the equipment, they also helped us do the rebuild. And the first coffee shop was born, and miraculous things began to happen. When I asked the Lord about why a coffee shop and why we're doing this, here's what he told me. He said, I'm going to bring people into this coffee shop who will never darken the door of a church. But your coffee is going to be your bait, and you're going to fish for men. And I remember that when we first got our, our um, espresso machines up and running, I learned how to actually make coffee. So surprising, the difference between a Keurig and an espresso machine and how it began to taste so good instead of like, I don't know what. Um, the first thing that happened is we had a young lady walk into our coffee shop, and she couldn't have been more than 17 years of age. In fact, her father's a very well-known pastor. He's on TV. People see him all the time in Oklahoma. She came into my coffee shop. She wasn't speaking a word. She simply wanted to buy a drink. She placed her order. She put the money on the counter, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, and he said, she's about to commit suicide. And I'm like, Lord, what do I do with this? <laughs> I mean, she's not talking. I don't know her. And the Lord said, I'll open the door. And when I do, you step through. Guys, sometimes when the door gets opened, it looks very frightening. And 
I'm going to tell you something. Most of the time, everything I'm doing in the coffee shop, I don't have a clue. I didn't drink coffee. I didn't know how to make coffee. I didn't know that you had all kinds of beans. I didn't know you had to learn grinds. I knew nothing. But you know that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Did you also know that the Bible says unless you're like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to have childlike faith. Faith that says if dad says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. When you tell a child that you're taking it on vacation and we're going to stop along the way and we're going to have Disneyland fun, they're going to say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Hey, hi, we're going to go. Mama says we're going to have this happen, and this is how we have to treat the Lord. If the Lord gives you a direction to walk, and you say, but Lord, I've never done this, but he says this is going to happen, you got to start going, Father, if you said it's going to happen, give me the ability, give me the strength, give me the fortitude, and take away the fear. So anyway, there she stood. And pretty soon, the Holy Spirit did just what he said he was going to do. He opened up a door. She started to take her drink, and I looked at her, and I said, Young lady, I know you don't know me, and I don't know you, but I hear the Father God speaking to me, saying that you're about to harm yourself. And that young woman went off on me. (laughs) I mean, she is screaming at the top of her lungs, how dare you, you don't know me. And I looked at her after she got through and I said, but Father God knows you. He knows where you're walking. He does not want you to end your life this way. This is not his plan. You walk through these doors because God has an appointment for you. And the next thing I know, I have a child on the floor in a puddle. And I'm going around the counter and I'm laying hands on her and praying for her and saying, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I come again against this suicidal spirit and the next thing I know is she is now coming to the coffee shop regularly to be mentored do you realize do you realize that you can sit in church and still break hell wide open we have children that are committing suicide by the hundreds we've got children in our school systems that are being targeted by witches I never thought than I would ever actually meet or know about witchcraft or the things of the enemy in such deep, dark darkness. I always thought that was on the movies or it was in some type of you know, horror show, but it was not real. Until one day, a woman walked in my shop, and again, Holy Spirit highlighted her to me and began to talk to me about her and said, she needs deliverance. She's here with me today. We battled together for months to see her delivered. Deb, I want you to come on up. I know she's scared to come up and talk to you guys. But she has a testimony, and I want you to hear this. I want you to understand that what we're doing in a coffee shop is not just selling you coffee, but it is a gateway to an opening for other people to have an encounter and then make a church home somewhere. So if you would, this is Deb. And she's got an amazing story to tell you. Sorry, I'm going to read this because this is a whole new adventure for me. I just want to thank you right now for letting me share a small glimpse of my testimony this morning. I'm up here sharing because I came to the Acadia Coffee Shop just for coffee. But something amazing happened. Before I begin, I just want to pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for bringing just who you say, for being just who you say you are. What we read in your word is only life and truth to help the broken, messed up people like us, Jesus. Man, I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you speak through me, hide all my imperfections, but only you flow freely to touch each person right where they are. Thank you for all you're going to do today. Amen. To start out, I didn't have a typical childhood. I'm an only child. I grew up in the great state of Maine. I know some of you are thinking, what's so bad about that, right? Well, all I knew was loneliness. My father and my mother was both into Satanism. My father was not a typical father, as what you probably grew up with. 
He was very dark. He was very cold. He was not loving. He was very abusive, both physical and mentally. I never once thought growing up that I mattered. All I heard was how I needed to be something else and was not wanted. So because of that, I experienced things that you probably think are only found in movies and on TV or in Hollywood. But please hear me. Satanism and demon possession is very, very real. I was covered by Satan, and his will was what I wanted, and I followed. You see, all my life, I only knew darkness. Being a witch, from a young child to a senior adult, I was married to Satan. I gave him everything, my worship, my time, my money, my blood. I gave him my heart. He was my God. If I was successful with the task that he asked, it was good. If I failed, it was painful. I know pain. I learned very early how to stuff feelings and tears, etc., down deep inside me and cover that pain and the trauma by using drugs and alcohol. At first, it was my father's stash that I got into, but soon I figured out how to get my own supply to numb myself. When we worshiped Satan, it wasn't for just an hour or two. It went on for hours. There was praise and sacrifices and blood. It flowed freely. All through my life, I kept this practice up, being a witch. I was all in. That's all I knew. I was not happy. My soul was dead. My heart was torn and covered and hidden. No one really saw me. I could not trust any person. I only trusted animals. I know that sounds crazy, but I only trusted animals. My dog was my family. Then he died very suddenly, and I was all alone. That was the end. I was at the end of wanting to live, and I could not get out of the hold Satan had on me. The demons that lived inside me kept me hidden, covered in shame, fear, and rejection. I was planning to end my life. I had no family, no friends, no one. To get a second of numbness, to stop the torment, I was a functioning alcoholic and drug addict. If you cut me, booze probably flowed freely first, and then the blood came out. Drugs was what I held on to just to survive. I could not go an hour without alcohol. Not cheap stuff, but the good stuff. Not just one bottle of wine, several bottles of wine all day long. The day I walked into the coffee shop in Arcadia, I was 100% numb. Even then, I was being torn apart by the voices inside me. They were screaming, get out of here, leave. But a peace, as soon as I opened that door, I'd never felt that peace before in my whole life. It was right there in that coffee shop. I thought, man, I'm going to die. I'm stepping into something, and I don't know what it is. I'm going to die. Before my coffee is even made, I'm going to die. The person behind the counter was making my drink, but I knew I did not belong. As I looked around, all I saw was crosses hanging on all the walls. Everywhere I looked, crosses. Man, what had I done? I got my drink, and I made a beeline for the front door. I could not breathe. I sat for a bit out front. But someone came outside. And on their way back, they stopped and asked me if I was okay. Could they pray for me? <laughs> of course, my response was not nice. I explicitly told them, no way. I had drank enough of my coffee to fit the booze in, to fill up my cup again. And so I went to my car, did that, and carried about, went on my way. Some time passed, and I came to Hope City Church on a mission. As I came in again, I heard I did not belong. I kept begging Satan to protect me. I still wanted someone to see me, the real me, the broken, 
ready to end my life, ready to end everything, person. Some time had passed, and I again went on a mission. Satan and his power was what I held on to, and I kept begging for that power to protect me as I was in the church. But the demons kept telling me, run, you do not belong there. You're going to get hurt. This day I happened to notice someone who looked like, well, they might be in charge or someone that knew what was going on. So for some crazy, unknown reason, I still cannot fathom, I went up to this person, I went up to her, and I said, as I'm speaking to her, I'm tapping her on the shoulder, and I said, hey, is it okay if I'm here? I, I don't believe in your God. See, the demons inside me were screaming at me to run, leave, but something deep inside was so wanting to have a sliver of hope that someone would see me for me, the real me, and care if I kept breathing. Little did I know that that person would become my best friend. This person saw me, the broken, torn, at the end of wanting to live person. She shared not only words with me, but over time, I saw Jesus pouring out of her eyes. Several months passed, and I can honestly say I found Jesus. He came and met me right where I am. He delivered me from the many demons who held on to me. They no longer, no longer have a place in me. I daily renounce Satan, for he lied, and he is a liar. Man, is he ever a liar. Jesus is my God. Hear me. Jesus is my God. He is tenderly, crazy tenderly changing me to be like him, showing me he is a caring, loving God, teaching me what love is. He delivered me from drugs and alcohol. It's been, it's been a little over a year now since I've partook in any of that. And he's, he's changing me. And it's so amazing. Um, that that kind of reminds me of a song. Um, it says, what the enemy meant for evil, God changes it for good. If you're at a similar place in your life today, thinking you don't matter, no one really sees you. And if you're using alcohol and drugs to self-medicate, or something else even, to numb from the constant noises on the voices that are screaming lies at you. If you are thinking quietly about ending your own life, please know this. Jesus sees you and wants you to know you did not come here by accident or just as a weekly task that you can check off on your weekly to-do list. You're here to know two very important things. One, you matter, and you are seen. And the second is, he is so wanting a relationship with you. Not religion, but a one-on-one -on -one daily relationship with you. There is more to my story, but I so desire you not to see me. Please don't see me. I'm a broken mess, mending with his help. See Jesus and how he comes for the broken and can use a simple, simple Jesus ministry coffee shop to change someone's life and make them who I'm trying to be. Thanks. So Deb's one of our testimonies about the coffee shop. You know, um, we were, I was praying about whether or not I should even be in Norman. I really like my church in Arcadia. I like being the co-pastor there. I have the coffee shop there running fairly smoothly with uh, volunteers. And uh, I remember it was a Wednesday night I was sitting there, and a young man came up to me and says, I have a word from God for you, and I'll tell you really, really, even though, 
we're in church settings. I'm very cautious when somebody comes up and says, I have a word from God. Here's the thing. The Bible promises we will recognize the spirit that is speaking. We can trust that the Holy Spirit in us will also bear witness. It's a gift of discerning. It says, I'll discern which spirit is talking. Anyway, he said, I have a word for you. And he says, I hear the Lord saying, I'm going to plant you in the enemy's camp. <laughs> I went, oh, that sounds like fun. Thanks. <laughs> and no sooner he had said that, I have, a, I have two sons. One is the pastor of Arcadia, and then I have a son that is not living for the Lord yet. Um, he lives in Oklahoma City, but started the business in Norman, Antique Paradise. And I helped him get that up and running and then brought a coffee shop into there. What I didn't know was that set right there in the middle of that particular area on 12th and Lindsay, there is a very large coven that lives there and comes to the back of the property to, or used to, to do incantations and whatever. And we took up residence there. I say we, me and Jesus and, and those that came with me to work in the coffee shop. And the other thing that's there is um, a very large gay community. Guys, we are not called to be religious. We are not called to put on robes of righteousness and pull them around us and say, I don't want to touch that. God said, go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. The broken, the lame, the maimed, the ones that nobody else wants, the ones that are rejected, the ones that are overlooked, the ones that would take your time and make you uncomfortable. He's calling us to souls. See, when Jesus looks down amongst us, he doesn't see black, white, red, purple, whatever. He sees souls. He doesn't see gay, straight. He doesn't see which, not which. He sees souls. And when he called us to follow him and to pick up our cross and come after him, he called us to go retrieve his creation, which is souls. And so when we came into Norman, the first time I walked in there, it was dark. I don't mean the lights were off. I mean, even with as much light as we have, it felt dark. And it was hard. And I was really struggling to go, well, why am I here, God? And to get the coffee shop up to even start it, I was like, Lord, I don't have the financing to do this. Because to, to, to start a coffee shop, you're looking at about $25,000 after you get your equipment and then your supplies. And I was like, it's going to take me about $15,000 to get the equipment. And I went to prayer and I said, Lord, if you've called me here, because I was really hoping the answer would be no and I could get, have a reason not to go. Um, anyway, I was praying. I said, Lord, if this is where you want me, you're going to have to bring it in. I don't know where it's coming from because I'm a single mom. I'm a single lady. I don't have a job. I'm retired. I have a fixed income. There is no money. I have no rich relatives. There's nothing like that going on. What I do have is faith in Jesus Christ. What I do have is I know that when we ask Jesus, what do you want us to do? If he calls us to a place, he said, I will equip you to do what I've called you. And furthermore, if I call you to a place and you say you don't have the ability to do it, but I've called you, then I will make sure that I give you the ability to walk. Because what he will give you is the infilling of the Holy Spirit who can do all things, who can teach us all things, who can open doors where we cannot open doors. So it was a Wednesday night, and I get a phone call. I'm on my way to a Bible study at Arcadia. I get a phone call, and on the other end is Jerry Drury, and he says, Hey, my church has just decided to totally purchase all of your equipment. I could have just been knocked over with a feather. I'm in tears, and I'm like, What? <laughs> you're going to do what? And so I go into our Bible study, and I said, You're not going to believe what just happened. Of course, my church went into a big uproar. There was all kinds of praises going to the Lord. And the next thing you know... We are now seated in Norman. <clears throat> and i got to tell you, Norman's an interesting place. You talk about a tale of two cities. This may be one city, but it has two sides. And it's an interesting town. But I'm going to tell you, where the Lord has stuck us, there are many who need an encounter with Jesus Christ. Listen, when he calls us, he doesn't promise that the way will be easy. He promises he'll make a way. So I'm in there, and... There's some dark things happening. We have people coming in. My, I'm inside of an antique booth. So my son, who is not saved, has all these vendors, and most of them do not know Jesus. In fact, I think there's only two other Christians in the whole building, and there are some really interesting things in those booths. And I started going in early and praying over the whole place. 
And the more I prayed, I started having nightmares. So then I went, this has got to end. So I went in and grabbed my anointing oil, and now I'm anointing every booth in that place. I anointed everything. I even anointed Google, and that stupid thing talked and said, I'm not connected to the Internet. And I went, what? I said, excuse me? My computers are on, and you're So I went, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. In the name of Jesus, you will respond with Christian music. And all of a sudden, it went dead. I was like, oh, we blew it up. And then it started playing Christian music. The nightmare still continued after I anointed the place, so I brought in some prayer warriors from my church in Arcadia. They came in on a Monday when the place was closed. We again, all three of us, went booth by booth, place by place, anointed everything, registers, Googled everything, the coffee shop, everything in there has been anointed. And then we saw, literally, black shadows zooming down an aisle as we're reading the word of God. They're zooming down. It looked like roaches running, only they were bigger. And so I went, this is great. Something just got expelled. It's gone. And I felt peace. I went home. There was no nightmares that night. We came back on the, uh, I think it was Wednesday, to, to work the coffee shop. And the first thing out of my volunteer's mouth was, hey, it feels light in here. Yes, it does. Guess why? So... The next thing that happened is we took literally a wooden stake. This is going to sound like something out of... <laughs> anyway, we took a wooden stake. I took it to church. The pastor anointed it with oil. We sopped it in oil. We prayed over it. And then he says, now go take territory. So I went back to Norman. I went out into the alley where the witches have done their nonsense. And not knowing what they have done at this point in time, went over to a tree. And my daughter and I, who's sitting over here, we went over there. And we started pounding that thing in the ground. And I'm praying the Jabez prayer. Lord, let me do no harm to anybody, but increase our territory. We are taking Norman for Jesus. Father, we're pushing back the powers of the enemy. My daughter looks up and she goes, all the hairs on my head and my back are standing up. I said, mine too, on my arm and everything. And she begins to pound that stake even harder all the way into the ground. We find out later that that very spot is where they were doing an incantation. Well, guess who just won that one? Hello, Jesus. We'll take this territory. We'll take it right from the enemy's hands. Listen, he is not more powerful. We've got to start realizing that what is in us is greater than what is in this world. And though he says to the people out there that he has all the power, it is our God who subdued him and brought one out of his kingdom and said, look, I'm going to use her now to begin to speak to those who are caught in darkness so that they will know that there is a hope, that there is a light, that there is a place that you can go. And I haven't even got to the scriptures yet, which is in John 4, but here's what I want you to understand. God is calling you not to sit on a pew, not to just come on a Wednesday and a Sunday, but he's calling you to go into the marketplace and be a light unto the world. No, I am not saying you have to step on a soapbox and start screaming at the top of your lungs, turn and burn. What I'm saying is he's sending you in to show how Jesus loved. Here's where we get it wrong. Because I have talked to many people that have come into my coffee shop who have so much church hurt. Can I tell you that the, that the broken do not need to hear that they're going to hell? What they need to hear from you is, do you know there is a God who loves you? Do you know that God loves you right where you are? Listen, I'm dealing with homosexual community, and i got to tell you, that was out of my comfort zone. If I could ever be a Pharisee, it would be then, because what I wanted to do was say, I know they exist, but please don't make me have to look at this. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to do with this. But here's what I do know. There is a Jesus who says, I see the soul in that human being that is crying out for love and acceptance, and all they need to hear from the Christian community is, do you know God loves you? We do not have to tell them that their pride is upsetting, that their pride is against God. We do not have to tell them that nonsense. They will tell you, I know I'm going to hell. It would be nice if Christians would tell me God still loved me. Now, if I'm rocking with your little theology, I'm sorry, but here's the facts. Jesus went into the community, and he got in trouble by who? Not by the sinners, but by the religious. Jesus was said, what are you doing? The, the religious said, what is your master doing sitting there with the drunkards, <laughs> eating and drinking with them? We are supposed to love like Jesus loved. Get into your Bible. How did Jesus love? Turn over to John chapter 4 and let me show you an example of how Jesus loves the unlovely. 
It is amazing. If we will love like Jesus, all of a sudden you don't have to be a preacher behind a mic or on a soapbox or out on the corner standing and screaming at the top of your lungs. You have to be a light. He said, I have called you to be a light on a hill that will penetrate into darkness. And I got news for you guys. Lights don't have a mouth. They shine. They pierce into the darkness. And they show a way out. Furthermore, when the light comes on, darkness flees. Light never says a word. It just is. So Jesus wants us to be like him. He wants us to go everywhere we go. The light should just penetrate. When we walk into a place, people should be going, there's something about them. You don't have to say a word. You should have Jesus just emanating out of you so that wherever you go, they are going, what is it about that person? Listen, this pastor is a broken human being. I will fail you. I will let you down. If you start looking to me and put me on a pedestal, I promise you this. I will let you down. You will be totally, absolutely just upset. But if you'll get your eyes off of humanity and put them where they should be, according to Hebrews 12, 2, that says, keep your eyes focused on Jesus, the author, the finisher of your faith. He did not find it, he said, but for the joy, did not find it shame, but went to the cross. What is he calling you to do today? He's calling you to lay down your humanity, to lay down your comfort, and to pick up a cross that will put you in a place where you feel uncomfortable, and you'll have to cry out and say, God, I don't know how to work here. I don't know how to minister here. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. In the coffee shop in Norman, I've been there now for three months, and we've, got, we've managed to get some coffee out the door. We're still not known well, but let me tell you what is happening there. I've got people that I'm ministering to by just being friendly. They didn't even know I was a preacher because I don't go around announcing that I'm a preacher. Listen, if God gives you a title, you don't need someone to announce it. God will make sure it's known. Been there three months. And I've been, the high, as soon as I walked in that store, the Lord began to highlight. He highlighted three different people to me. One of them, I think, is a practicing witch. And I just, I adore her. Her name is Susan. I adore her. The other one is, is a young woman who, who has a, a booth there in, in Honestly, she told me in no uncertain terms, don't talk to me about God. Can't stand Christians. I don't want anything to do with them. If you want to be my friend, don't you ever bring that stuff around me. And then the other person the Lord highlighted to me is married to a woman. And I just think she's amazing. And her name is Claire. She's a phenomenal woman. And God has a purpose and a plan for each of them. And right now, all he wants me to do is to show Jesus to them. So one day... One day, Claire is in the back. Claire is sweeping up the store. She's just helping us. She just does good things. And I looked at her, and I said, Claire, you're such a good person. She stepped back and put the broom down. She goes, no one's ever called me good. And it broke my heart. And I said, but Claire, you need to hear that often. Because you are good. Not righteous. But there's something in her that is good and it's begging for it to come out and it wants to be seen just like Deb's humanity wanted to be seen just like Deb's soul was crying out and saying, I just want someone to see that there's a human here that's dying and and about to end life. All people want is for someone to recognize that they're hurting, they're broken, and that they're dying. And without Jesus, they're going to hell. And so what we're supposed to do is to be that light, be that love, love like Jesus did. And so I walked up to Claire as I was leaving that day, and I said, Claire, can I just hug you? I honestly thought she was going to (laughs) faint. And so she goes, okay. So I hugged her, and I whispered in her ear, and I said, Claire, you need to hear often you're good. And God loves you. I let go of her, and I stepped back, and her friend Kathy goes, I need a hug, I need a hug, and comes running at me. And so I'm hugging Kathy. And she's the one that told me that I'm never to talk to her about God. I'm never to share with her about my faith. So I just kept loving on her. Last week, I was really, really sick, and Deb was working with me up at the coffee shop here in Norman. And we were sitting there. We had just got through praying, and I was like, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing here. This is a hard ministry over here. I'm all alone, and you, you always send your people out by twos, but you've sent me out. Well, Deb's walking with me. Thank you for that, Lord. I give you that. I'm just so glad that I've got Deb helping me on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I said, but I've been up here working this by myself, and this week I'm really sick. My body is physically sick. And you know the enemy likes to attack when you're physically down? He's not fair. He don't play right. He likes to play mean. <laughs> 
And so I'm sitting there, and I said, Deb, I don't know. I don't know what we're doing. And Deb goes, well, I felt like God called me here. I'm like, there you are, preacher. How do you like that? And so I went back to prayer, and I said, Lord, if you really have called me here and I haven't missed your will, I need you to show me that I'm making an inroad. And in that very moment, it was what, within seconds, Kathy walked in and she goes, hey, did you find the present I left for you? And I'm like, what, you left me a gift? Yeah, I've got a gift for you. And so I found it, and I, it was a scroll, and I unrolled it. And here's what she gave me. See, Antique Paradise, it's, it has flamingos as its logo. So see all the little flamingos? I don't know if you can see it well, but there's flamingos, and it says this. It says, God says... Kathy gave this to me, and she says, God says you are unique. You are special. You are lovely. You are strong. You are precious, and you are chosen. Here's a woman who said, don't talk to me about God, who brings me something that says, God says I'm all this with the scriptures below. And I looked at her, and tears are running down my face, and I said, Kathy, this is from you. She goes, yes, yes. My heart loves you. See, we can be a light and not have to preach a word and just show Jesus. And all of a sudden, the broken are drawn to Jesus. They're just drawn to him. They want to be where he is. And so when Jesus is coming up and out of us, even when we're not feeling our best or like we matter, all of a sudden, the broken is drawn to him. So in John 4, chapter, or John 4, first verse, it says this, where I lost my notes. <laughs> it says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples, Jesus left Judah and departed again for Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. Now let me tell you something. This is interesting. No, he didn't have to. Most of the Jewish people would walk around Samaria I'm going to give you a little background about Samaria. Samaria was what they, the Jews considered to be half-breeds. They had been a, uh, the north, let's see, they were the northern kingdom. They had been total Jews, but they were Jews who began to bring in mixture. I'm going to tell you something, people. God does not want mixture in our worship. You cannot serve God and hold on to the world. You cannot serve God and think that you can bring in new age things. You cannot hold on to one side and the other and think it's going to be okay. God will have a reckoning day. So the northern kingdom kept bringing in. So they had the Torah. They were following sort of the the law of God, but they also had been mixing idol worship in, and God kept trying to get their attention. When finally they won't be heard or they won't hear God, he sends the Assyrians in. The Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom, took out all but 20% of that kingdom into captivity, and then transplanted foreigners into Samaria, which was, the king, which was actually God's land, and they began to force intermarriage. So now we have half Jews, half foreigners, and the southern kingdom thought, we want any part of them. They are half-breeds. Funny thing is, isn't it interesting about human beings? We sometimes want to say, well, I'm more righteous than so-and-so. Well, I never did witchcraft. Really? Because the Bible says rebellion is the same thing as witchcraft. Hmm. Furthermore, how about this one? Some of us want to say, well, I've never done anything horrible. I've served the Lord all my life. Really? Because the Bible also says there are none righteous. No, not one. His name was Jesus. The only righteous lamb, the only son of God, the only one who did not sin throughout his entire human life. He came that we might be restored to the Father. But we, as human beings, humankind, constantly have shortcomings. And none of us are greater or better than anybody else. I don't care if you have a title pastor over your name or a prophet or apostle or whatever. You're still a human being. What you are is a, a, is a container, is a vessel. A vessel used by the master, filled with his spirit, for the master to pour you out like a drink offering for those who do not know him. That's what we are. That's what I am. And so when Jesus calls us and says, come follow me, what he's saying is, put down your way, your will, your wants. 
tell that flesh to die daily and come follow me. I've had so many people, well, coffee shop ministry is not my calling. Really? Have you asked God what your calling is? Because according to the word of God, he said, go make disciples of all nations. I'm sorry. That means if you're a somebody, a, you are a who, then you're called. Well, I don't go out and start coffee shops. Okay, fine. Where do you work? Are you a light? Are you a, an Eeyore? Or are you a Tigger person? Tigger's always happy and bouncy and sunshine and always. I think Tigger looks at Jesus and is constantly happy. Where Eeyore is like, I could die. Oh, where's God? Listen, we're called to be the light. We're called to shine. We're called to penetrate darkness and cause it to push back. We're to go in and take territory in the name of Jesus. We have power, not in ourselves, but in him. When you begin to recognize who you are in Christ Jesus, all of a sudden you can do all things through him who strengthens you. Now in your own might, you'll find yourself to be like the sons of Sceva. Go up against the devil and he'll go, I know who John, was it Paul and I know who Jesus is. Who are you? And now you've got to fight, and you're going to lose. But when I come at the enemy in the name and the authority of Jesus and by the blood covering, he cannot touch me. He cannot get near me. He knows he has to flee, and he takes off running because he knows that what stands above me is the God I serve. His name is Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lion of Judah. He stands and he goes, you will not touch my beloved. See, the problem is we come out in our own might thinking we are all that when in truth we are nothing except what Jesus calls us to be and who the Holy Spirit empowers us to be at that moment. And by the way, even the best of us who the Lord likes to use has our moments where we are broken and down. You don't think so? What about this story? Elijah, a mighty man of God, a prophet who just killed 400 prophets of Baal, came down to the river depressed and going, I am the only one that serves you. <laughs> Every one of us has humanity that we have to work with and deal with and put down and say, Lord, forgive me and help me to realize you've called me to do something greater than this. So here we have a story where Jesus is moving into Samaria and he's going to the well and he sees there, there is a well. Look at verse uh, five. So he came to the, the town of Samaria called Sychar near the field of Jacob. Now remember, Jacob was a Jew. Jacob had 12 sons of Israel. He gave Samaria to his son, Joseph. So where we're at right now, though the Jews are skirting around it, actually was given by God to the Jews. Anyway, so he sees there's Jacob's well. Look at verse 6. And he says, so Jesus wearied. He's tired because at this point he's in his human form. He's choosing to let his humanity show. So he's not letting the divine come out at that moment. He's weary. He sits down. And he says it's about the sixth hour, which means it's about noon. Verse 7, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me something to drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Let me stop right there for just a second and tell you something about this because I never understood why this was an important statement, living water. We know as Christians, especially in the um, charismatic world, that living water represents Holy Spirit. But it was more than that here. She recognized something when he said that to her. Remember, this is a woman who's been rejected by her own people. They have set her aside. She comes to the well at midday because she is a woman that they consider of ill repute. She's living with a man that's not her husband. She's had five husbands before this man, and everybody in town is shunning her. Talk about major rejection. Her own people don't want her. And now here she's encountering this man, a Jew, who says, give me a drink, who starts conversation with her. She's totally shocked. She goes, what? And he's going, listen, I have a gift. If you had asked me, I have a gift. I would have given you living water. Now, he's talking spiritual. She's still on the flesh. But what that word to her meant at that moment was this. Even the Samaritans who were keeping Torah, though they had mixture, 
also understood that if you became unclean according to the law, you had to go to the mikvah, which was a big bath area that was fed by a living spring. To be physically cleansed, because you were now made unclean, whether you touched a dead thing or an animal or something that wasn't clean, you had to go to the mikvah, you had to immerse your body, come up, and then you were made ritually cleansed. He just said to her, I will give you a spring of living water. I will cleanse you. I will cleanse you. She understood physical cleansing. Isn't that interesting? So the story goes on. Look on down, and this says, verse 12, Are you greater than our father Jacob? <laughs> Isn't it interesting? She's even claiming Jewish ancestry, Jacob. It says, He gave us this well to drink from, and he himself drank from it, as did his sons and his livestock. Verse 13, Jesus said to her, If everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. He's still speaking spiritually. She's still thinking flesh. The water that I will give him will become a living spring within him, welling up into eternal life. And then the woman says to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here ever again. Why? She don't want to deal with humanity. I don't want to see these people. If I never have to come to this well, this would be great. She's still in the flesh. Lord, give me this. I want that. I don't want to have to come here and deal with people. Frankly, people are mean. I don't like them. <laughs> Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go first and call your husband and come back. The woman says to him, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying so. For the, the man you live with now is not your husband, but you've had five husbands, and this one you're with is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, let me catch you. Did that sound like he just put her down? No, he did not. He did not. He just stated the facts. And she says, oh, I perceive that you are a prophet. And I'm like, duh, you think? He just told you everything about yourself. Our fathers worshiped. Now she's going to another subject. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. She's talking about the mountain there where Jacob's well is. It was the Mount of Gerizim. The Samaritans were not accepted by the Jews, were not allowed to go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple there. So they built themselves a temple on Mount Gerizim, and they put the priest in there so that they had a place to worship. So again, she's speaking fleshly. We come here to worship, but you are saying that we shouldn't worship here. But you Jews say, look on if you go on down here it says our fathers worship on this mountain but you say that in jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship jesus said to her woman believe me the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in jerusalem will you worship the father you will you worship what you do not know we worship what we know for salvation is from the jews but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship God. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He that is called Christ, meaning the anointed one. When he comes, the anointed one, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak with you am he. I'm going to stop right there for just a minute, and we're going to go into some points. First of all, isn't it interesting? He went through Samaria where everybody else who was a Jew would ignore and skirt around. And it said he had to go in. He was setting up an appointment time with a woman that was rejected by her own people, rejected by the Jews. But Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, came straight to where she was. A woman who had been rejected by all humanity, who had no hope. And where does she find Messiah? At the well with her. Isn't it interesting? Jesus didn't reveal himself as Messiah to the religious. He used the word son of man. He used the word I am. He never flat came out and said, I who speak with you in the Messiah. Isn't it interesting? He chose to, to, to reveal his, his being the Messiah to someone who everybody else rejected. Could it be that we get so religious sometimes that we're missing out on the very outpouring and revelation of who God is? See, my little grandma, who has been a preacher for many, 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 many years, over 31, she's in heaven now, but she used to say, sometimes we get so heavenly-minded, we're absolutely no earthly good. People don't need to hear your platitudes. 
The dying and the broken do not need to hear that they're going to hell. What they need to hear from you as a light, as a child of God, as a Christ follower. They don't need to hear your denomination. They don't need to hear your religion. And by the way, the Bible even says religion will kill you. The the law was given to show you like a mirror your need for God. The new covenant was Jesus who came in grace and truth. And he then said, look, I have fulfilled the law so that because you can't keep it anyway. And now you can walk under my grace. Grace is not a, 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 a give all where you can sin all the time you want and go, well, I'm under grace. It's all covered. No, no, no. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. What happens is when you come into the, 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 the encounter of grace, which is Jesus Christ, when Deb came into our coffee shop and encountered the peace and the love and the mercy of God, everything in her, the humanity of her began to scream out, this is what I've been looking for. This is what I desire. Now the demonic in her began to scream, get out of here, because they recognized she was about to come face to face with the, the power of God who would set her free once and for all. And what happened after she got saved is she no longer decided, oh, I, gotta, I, can, I can have a little drink here, or I can do a little witchcraft here, or I can play a little bit here. I'm under grace. No, no, no. When she came to God, she said, I don't want to touch that stuff. I don't want to look at that stuff. Don't make me look backwards. She wants to get away from it. She pushes back. She's had people come to her and say, is this, is this necklace that I got? Is it, is it witchy? And she's like, I don't even want to look at the stuff. See, when you really have an encounter with God, when you really have met him and the Messiah shows him and says, I am he who speaks with you, everything in you then is changed because all of a sudden everything that was hurt, everything that has been rejected, everything that was broken goes, this is the God who loves me. And he loves me so much and he died for me that I don't want to go back into what I used to be. I want to receive the fullness of who he's calling me to be. That's the difference between religion and actually having a relationship. See, God didn't call you to be an assembly of God person. He called you to be a Christ follower. It isn't about Baptist, Methodist, assembly, Catholic, whatever. Religion will kill you, but relationship will save you. Do you hear what I'm saying? We get so caught up. You know why there's so many denominations? Because we as human beings cannot agree on anything. So we get offended and we say, well, I'll just pull off of here. Let me tell you, we pulled off of the Methodists long before we became assemblies. Because we got offended. Because they got offended. I don't want that that stuff to happen where people are dancing around and falling out. And hey, listen, if the power of God touches me, I don't care how it makes this body react. I'll take anything and everything God wants to give me. If it means I flop on the floor like a fish and look like a fool in front of you, but I'm full of the power of God, so be it. Now, on the other hand, I believe that the Lord says in 1 Corinthians, there is a proper way to work in the giftings of the Holy Spirit. And some of us have gotten a little foolish and we've let the flesh walk in. So we become to repel people with the gifts of the Spirit instead of drawing them to God. Because see, when the real giftings of the Holy Spirit begin to move, they have this ability to begin to just pull you in but when the flesh is in operation it has a way of repelling you so when you see people in your denomination or in your church and they start feeling uncomfortable because of whatever is going on you start praying lord let only your spirit be seen let the spirit of god be what operates within us and if i don't know how to operate correctly lord because my spirit let me tell you when holy spirit comes upon me everything in me trembles everything in me wants to just sink down to the floor but the lord strengthens me and says no stand up i've got something for you to do you will operate but you will operate in a way that will bring them to me not repel them from me See, a lot of the times we're just not taught. Or we've accepted what other people have taught us, but never gone to the Word and sought it out for ourselves. Can I tell you something? Don't you ever take the preacher's word for it. I told you today the scriptures are in John chapter 4. You go for yourself and you read this story and you see if God does not talk to you about how he comes to her. Let me show you this real quick because I know I need to be closing up. I can't see your clock, but I'm sure I'm getting out of time. First thing that Jesus did when he met her is he started a conversation, but he didn't argue. We do not argue with people. 
They are ready for a fight. What they're not ready for is absolute love and concern. It undoes them. It undoes them. So we don't argue. Here's three things that was offered to Jesus at the well that could have been an argument. First thing she did was she put out race. My ethnic background is I'm a Samaritan. Jesus didn't even acknowledge that. He just stepped right over it. Well, the next thing she did, she threw out, well, I'm also a female gender. Hello. How much do we hear on the news today about gender and about race? By the way, let me shake you up a little bit. Did you know that race is not a God-made thing? It was a man-made thing. Because God said, I created all humankind in my image. Had nothing to do with white, black, red, purple. I don't know what colors you are. But here's the bottom line. He created you in his image. When you start pulling the race card, you're saying that one race is, <laughs> has evolved greater than another one. Well, guess what? I don't believe in evolution. Therefore, your argument is totally wrong. Because Jesus said in Genesis 1.1, or actually God said, I spoke into creation and it was. And wasn't it on the sixth day? He created man in his image. And it was. And he said, and it's good. So if you've got a problem with a race thing going on, check yourself. Because Jesus didn't call you to hold up race. He didn't call you to hold up religion. He didn't call you to hold up arguments. Here's the next one. She said, well, I'm also a woman. Then she goes, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say you want water, but you have nothing to draw with. She's going into reasoning. Here's another problem with some of us in church. Not me, because I don't have this. My brain must look like spaghetti. But a lot of people have brains that have little compartments. And they begin to compartmentalize things. And they reason things. And they reason and reason and reason until they've reasoned themselves out of being in God's presence. Am I saying being foolish and take everything gullibly? No. But what I am saying is that sometimes you can put so much reasoning out there that you reason the Spirit of God to the side. Come back to this verse. Unless we are like a child, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. Mamas, how do our children act? They take us at our word. When we tell them something, they know that they better either do it or there's going to be consequences. But they also know if we promise them something, that they will receive it. We have to come to God like that. If he says it, if it's in his word, he cannot lie. The Old Testament says, I am God. I cannot lie. When I send my word out, my word will come back to me, not void, but it will accomplish what I've sent it to do. I cannot lie. He is not man that he should lie. That's what the word of God says. So what do we stand on? We stand on what the Bible says. If, you don't, if you're going through a problem, listen, I have a child right now, and it's driving me crazy because I told you I don't deal well with, with the idea of having to help people come out of homosexuality. My brain doesn't wrap around it. I don't even understand it. But God does, and that's all that needs, I need to know is that God loves him. He, I have a son who's living a gay lifestyle. I don't know how to handle all this. And I can tell you, I handled it all wrong. I wounded that child. I wounded him so badly that for a while he didn't want anything to do with God, with church, with our family. Because I came at him wrong. See, we can talk about sin, but it's how we talk about it. If you start talking to a wounded person about their sinful life in a way that brings them down and it's condemning and it brings guilt. Guess what voice you're using? It's not the voice of God. It's a voice of an enemy. For what does the Bible say? But the the lie that the, that the, the enemy, he is the one, the accuser of the brother comes to bring death. He comes to lie. He comes to steal. He comes to bring guilt and condemnation. What did Jesus? To say, I have come not to condemn the world, but to give the world abundant life. How does that happen? See, here's the problem. Most of us think that we have to preach sin and preach, tell them that they're going to hell because we're scared. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do with a child that came to me and said, Mom, I don't understand what's happening to me, but I have this feeling towards men instead of women. This mom was about to die. I was like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. So I did everything wrong. When all that child needed to hear was, God will help you. I will pray with you. God still loves you. 
See, we got to get past the sin and start looking at the humanity. There is a human there that is dying, that is just desperate to be accepted and loved. But we want to preach at them and tell them the do's and don't list. Can I tell you, your do and don't list will kill you. But Jesus said, I've come and I'll sit right down beside you while you're drinking your beer. And I'll tell you a good story. I am not condemning sin. I mean, I am not condoning sin. I am condemning sin. I am not condoning sin. I'm saying there is a way to approach the broken like Jesus did. The Pharisees brings a woman caught in the act of adultery. Not the man, just the woman. But she was caught in the very act, so where was he? We'll talk about that later. Anyway, so here's this poor woman being brought up in front of all these people. And they say, what do you want to do, Rabbi, looking to Jesus? She was caught in the very act, and our law says that she should be stoned. Jesus didn't jump on that bandwagon. You see, part of us also wants to jump on the bandwagon with popular opinion. Whatever the, the right then crowd is saying is what we, because we don't want to stand. I don't know about you, but I hate confrontation. But I'm okay with it as long as I know the Spirit of God is the one that's doing the confronting. And he finally looks up and he says, he started writing, you know the story, he writes on the ground and all of a sudden all the con- people that are accusing her walk away. I have to believe he's writing down there everything that they've ever done. You know, I mean, come on, I don't want to throw a rock if, if he's saying over here, well, I caught you one time doing this and this and this. So he looks up and they're all gone and he looks at the woman and he says, woman, where are those who condemned you? They're all gone. And Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Now he did give an instruction, didn't he? Go and don't sin anymore. But I can tell you that when Jesus offered that to her and offered that grace, it didn't make her feel guilty. It didn't make her feel condemned. It didn't make her feel rejected. All of a sudden, she felt the warmth of a loving Savior that said, I've got you. The woman at the well, at the end of their conversation, when he begins to tell her everything about herself, here's a woman who's been rejected by all humanity and then comes into an encounter with the Messiah, the anointed, the, the one that they've been waiting for. And it changed her so instantly that, remember, she wanted that living water so she never had to see these people again. Now she leaves her water buckets and she runs into town and becomes the first missionary evangelist and says, come and see a man who told me everything about myself. And I have to believe that when she was saying that, it was more like this. Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done that you all rejected me for, and he still loves me. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be? See, Jesus is calling you today to take the gospel into the workplace or into a school system or into whatever it is you are doing. For me, it's a coffee shop. If you're a single mama or if you're a married woman and you're at home and you still have young ones coming up, you've got an important job to do. That's bring up that household to know God first and foremost before you go into a calling. There will be others of us who have got the ability, because our kids are out and moving, that God says, okay, now I want you to move into a place where you can be a mama to the broken that have no home, have no family. He's calling you today not to sit in here. You're here to fill up so you can take out that precious spirit of God and give it to the dying. He's calling you. Somebody asked me, are you going to share with us and tell us what we could do to help you? Well, you helped us already by buying the equipment for us. We still need volunteers, but here's what I need. I need spirit-filled people who are willing to be used by the Holy Spirit to step out in obedience when it scares the living daylights out of you. I don't want a person coming into the coffee shop that wants to stand on a soapbox and preach and scream, sin, burn, and pretend. I want someone to stand up like Jesus did and say, hey, I know the brokenness you're feeling, the rejection you feel. I know the pain of it. And I have an answer for you. His name is Jesus. And he will love you where nobody loved you. He will accept you even in your brokenness. Listen, Deb and I are talking to people over there in the coffee shop here in Norman who are living a lifestyle where everybody else is, has rejected them. Claire came to me and she, and she told Deb, she, Deb told, actually Deb told Claire, she said, I've lived your lie. Hello, what? <laughs> she goes, I've lived that lie. But I can tell you there's a church that will accept you. Guys, I got a problem with this. I don't believe any building or any denomination 
has got it all right. You're the church. She said, I know a church, let me break it down. I know a body of believers who will accept you right where you are. Come to our body of believers. And, of course, Claire goes, oh, no, 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 no. There's not a church here that will accept us. And so Deb told me this, and the other day I happened to run into Claire again, and I, I hugged her, and I said, so glad to see you again. And I said, oh, by the way, Claire, i got to tell you something. I understand you don't think there's a church on this planet that would accept you, but you're wrong. There's a body of believers who will. And furthermore, I'm the co-pastor of that place. Come and sit beside me. And anybody that wants to take up any kind of issue with you will have to go through me first. See, we're called to bring in the lost, not pull away from them, not be like them, but to show them a way out of their darkness. She goes, what about my wife? And I said, bring her. Bring your wife. Because you know what? If they never come to where we are, how can they hear the gospel? So if they will not come to us, guess what? It means we have to go to them. That's why there's coffee shop ministries. Not because I need to make a dime making coffee. I'm not in it for the money. If I was, holy cow, I'd already hung up the shingle because we're not doing great that way. But I'll tell you what we are doing good with. We are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whether we ever make a profit or not does not matter to me as long as the Lord keeps us open. And by the way, I have a secretary that takes care of now both of my shops. And she was telling me the day, she goes, this doesn't work out on paper. <laughs> she goes, we don't have what we're bringing in. We send out more than what we're bringing in. And yet we're able to meet our bills. We've never been late. We're able to take care of people who have financial needs. We have literally paid the rent for people. We have met utility bills. We have sent out food baskets. We have ministered to those who have broken porches and built new porches. Not because we have money, but because I believe that Jesus said, if I send you, I will also provide the way to make it happen. And so more than once, we have stepped out with no money in the bank and met a need. And Jesus would bring somebody in who would then replace what we spent. There's several ways you can help the coffee shop, but more importantly, there's several ways you can be used by God. If you're working, be the light. Those people in your workplace do not need to hear how horrible they are. They know it, I promise. They know it. What they do need to hear is, do you know God loves you? Find something about them that you can begin to edify and build up and say, man, I love the way you dress. I love your smile. You know God created a good thing when he created you. <laughs> they want to hear that. Start with relationship. Jesus started a conversation. First thing we have to do is start the conversation. Listen, it's about building relationship. Sometimes we get that wonderful privilege of instant they come to God instantly. We have them. We walk them right through salvation. But most of the time, I worked for three months with Deb in my home before she was totally and absolutely delivered. Had I stopped? You're right, Lord. Had the Holy Spirit given up at one time, had he not strengthened me to be able to do it, and if I had not been obedient to follow Holy Spirit, who knows what would have happened? He's calling you to be that vessel. Pour Jesus out in the community. Are you a waitress? Fabulous. Make sure you let them know that you've prayed over them today. Are you a mama? Pray over your kids before you send them to school because we've got witches in the school. Isn't it interesting we can't pray in school, but the school here and more allowed a witch to come in and sage a room? Excuse me? But how about this one? God planted a child of God in that very school system who began to pray over that classroom and said, I come against what that just happened. That ain't going to happen here. See, you can be used by God wherever you are if you're obedient. Ministry is not standing by the whole pulpit all the time. Ministry is go out into the community and become a light and compel them to come in. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to share the word. And, Father, I ask that it penetrates into the hearts of your people, that they would become willing. And, Lord, that they would begin to search their soul and say, Lord, have I pleased you? Am I being used by you? We have so many excuses, Lord, of why we can't be used and that this isn't our calling and that isn't our calling. But the truth is, Lord, you called us to go make disciples. <sighs> Thank you.
Father, right now, I ask that you would begin to move throughout these benches. Holy Spirit, put your light on where we really stand with you. Lord, I'm asking that the fire of God would begin to pour out into this place. Let this church become a firehouse for you. Let the coffee shop become a gateway to help those who don't have a church home to find fellowship here at this particular body of believers. Lord, I'm not concerned with the denomination so much as I'm concerned with people who want to pick up the cross and follow you, who are willing to step out of their comfort zones and be used by the Spirit of God to minister to the broken, the hurting, the down and outers. Lord, I pray that you would change the minds and the hearts of each one of us today and that we would say, Lord, if I have become cold and indifferent, that you would let the fire of God spark within my soul again. Lord, that you would let the fire of God fall once again here in Norman. Lord, we're taking territory for you. We come against the enemy of this town, this city. I come against the enemy who wants to keep us silent and tell us we have no authority and no right. Father, we will be a light that will speak louder than any word. Let your light show shine through us that it penetrates like fire. Lord, I thank you right now that you are bringing each of us with a hunger to be used by you. If you're here today and you say, Sister, I'm not where I should be. I'm not on fire for God. I don't want to embarrass you, but if you'll raise your hand, I will be praying over you. Because here's what I believe. Gee, yes, I see that hand. Thank you. I believe God is calling you to step into deep waters with him. We talk about revival. Honey, he wants to bring fire into your soul. He wants you to become not just a burning ember, but a roaring, raging fire that everywhere you walk in this town, in this city, that the Spirit of God literally is felt. I see that hand. Lord, right now, I pray that you would just touch each man, woman, and child in this place. Holy Spirit, take up that place in their holies of holies in their soul and let the fire fire of God begin to burn once again. Lord, when they see the broken of this city, that their heart begins to break because your heart breaks for them, Lord. Because you, Lord Jesus said, I left the 99 to go after the one. Father, let us be a tool in your hand to rescue the one in the name of Jesus. If you would like prayer today, you're welcome to come to the front. I know pastors here, and I know others will come to pray with you. But if you have a need and you really would like for the Lord to meet you, we would like to meet with you here, and we'll pray with you. Is there anybody or many that would like to come and have prayer this morning?